Good afternoon. I would like to invite you with us to go and to find out more about three minute thesis competition. This is the opportunity for you to understand what is this challenge that we launch to our PhD students and also to understand what is this amazing contest. I will, would like to invite first Professor Claudia Cavadas, the Vice Director of uh, in Research here at University of Coimbra, to speak, here, to, speak to us uh, what she think about this challenge and to launch uh, this final. Thank you, Anna. So good afternoon, everyone. It is a pleasure to have this second edition of the Three Minutes Thesis Competition at University of Coimbra, where the PhD students that are waiting have to present their PhD thesis in three minutes. This initiative is very relevant to develop communication skills for the PhD students and also is an opportunity to communicate to general public, because this is for everyone, the science that we have been doing at the University of Coimbra. This three minutes thesis competition uh, at the University of Coimbra is integrated in an international competition led by the Coimbra Group. So the Coimbra Group is a network of 40 European universities. This uh, network of universities was founded in 1985. And in fact, it's an association of European comprehensive multidisciplinary university of uh, high international standards. The Coimbra Group, so this network, is committed to promote internationalization, academic collaboration, excellency in learning and also in research, and also to service to society. So um, it is also the purpose of Coimbra Group to influence European education and research policies uh, to develop best practices uh, through the mutual exchange experience. But before starting, before giving the floor to the students, I would like to acknowledge the students that apply to this uh, competition and of course the 20 final students that are here waiting. And of course, I would like to acknowledge the jury. A competition without the jury is not a competition. So thank you, uh, all the members of the jury that are here and who are evaluating the last, uh, uh, also before. Uh, and of course, uh, without an organizing team, there is no competition. So first, I would like to also to acknowledge Karin, Marta, Sara, and of course, Anna Carvalho that was leading all this organization. So uh, I don't, So we want to hear the science, not a vice director talking. So please, Anna, the floor is yours. Go ahead. And thank you, all of you. Thank you so much for this inspiring uh, words. So now I would like to share with you a little bit about the story uh, that is still short, but I think it will be uh, bigger and bigger every year about the treatment thesis here at the University of Coimbra. So uh, this is a challenge to all of us, to all the uh, uh, students and all the PhD students here at university, because we know that a thesis, a PhD thesis with around uh, eight, uh, 800, uh, sorry, 80,000 words of thesis that need nine hours to be shared. Here, they have the challenge to do it in only three minutes. But moreover, this is not a presentation to experts in the area. This is a presentation for, for all, for all the public that want to, more, to know more about science. We start uh, this challenge at University of Coimbra inside of Coimbra Group last year. And it was an amazing challenge to bring this competition to our PhD students, because this is the way for us, for them to start to understand how important in science communication and how important it is to share science communication and their uh, science with the others. So we have these amazing 20 uh, finalists last year. We were in Casa das Caldeiras. Fortunately, it was on person. This year we have uh, this uh, novelty in our competition, but I think we are doing a great job. Too. So um, we have our uh, winner, Mauro Pinto, that was our representative of the university last year on the competition. And you can know more about all uh, our um, participants, our finalists in our website. So, but about this edition, the second edition where we are now, we had 41 candidates, so even more than last year. So we are getting more 
people uh, participating in this uh, uh, in this competition. So our students are understanding the importance of science communication. And now we have today with us the 20 finalists that will share with us their presentations. The winner of today will be our representative in Prague uh, to the final, um, to this final se session. Um, he will be a first uh, or a second round of uh, classification and the three best from the, 20, the 41 universities uh, of the Greenberg Group will be uh, in this competition in Prague, we hope in person, let's see. So how it works? We ask for our participants to do applications, then send us uh, their videos that they just recorded at home. They share it with us and we uh, send it to our uh, jury. So our jury that is uh, composed, sorry, our jury that is composed by uh, several um, of our several uh, different uh, amazing uh, professors and scientists of our university that had uh, the mobility to be with us in this competition in order to evaluate uh, our students. So today we have, we have with us 13 of them that will do it uh, live. Not only the presentations will, will be live, but also the evaluation. So it's a challenge not only for the students, but also for the jury that will be here with us. They will evaluate mainly three different criteria. The comprehension, the capacity to transmit the message. So if it is understandable for the public, if it is clear or not, also the scientific content. What is if the presentation addresses the research question, if it is correct or not, and moreover, also if it is engageable and if the communication is um, adaptable to the audience and if they have enthusiasm doing it. Also, and in order to uh, prepare and to help our students to be even better uh, in the future and also to die to this final, we uh, give them the opportunity to be part of a science communication and public speaking training that take, took place uh, la uh, last month. So um, some of, uh, of us from the organizing committee and also speak and lead have the opportunity to be with our uh, students and to help them to give some tips, some hints, not only about the importance of the science communication, but also how to be in front of a camera, how to position, how to change lights, how to change all the set in order to be the best for these uh, presentations. We also uh, challenge them to think about this, uh, to think about projects in science communication and would reform this design thinking uh, workshop for them to think more about science and about uh, science communication. Here is a picture that you took from uh, that section. In the second day of our um, training, we had the opportunity to give to all of the participants a public speaking and science communication workshop, not only for the finalists, but for all of them, and also uh, individualized um, help and also tips to every one of our finalists to put them the best to present in this final. Here is a gift that you took at the end of this uh, amazing session. Today, what we are doing today, we want to hear our uh, finalists to present their thesis in three minutes. So the rules are they need to do it in less than three minutes in English, uh, only uh, with a slide that we will share with you before they present. They will be alone in the uh, in the in the ecran in the um, in your vision, um, we need to, rec uh, to record it live and they cannot use any kind of nothing in the hands, no objects, no um, past lights, nothing to, uh, to be uh, with them. And also they cannot sing. They just can change, uh, share with us uh, their presentations. So we did a random selection of the order of our 20 finalists. And this, this will be the order that will took place during their presentations. 
Okay, so we are almost ready, but after, and to just to highlight you how it will be all the session, they will present the 20 finalists. They will have three minutes per each one, and you, uh, I will have the timer on my own um, on video. Uh, then we have uh, the jury that will have 10 minutes to complete their classification and to have uh, a winner, and then uh, Professor Claudia Cavadas will announce the podium and also the winner that will be the representative of the University of Coimbra at uh, Coimbra Group International Competition. So I think we are almost ready to start. So I hope you are all right, all ready. Also, our uh, finalists are ready to start. So let's start. We will do it by this random order and we will start with Daniela Alves. Daniela Alves will present us his thesis uh, entitled Pre Predicting the Occurrence of Large Forest Fires Based on Climatic and Meteorologic Factors. Uh, she's coming from the PhD of Mechanical Engineer from the Faculty of Science and Technology. And she shared uh, with us, um, she will share with us he, uh, her thesis about uh, forest fires. So, with no more delongs, I will uh, share uh, with you. Stop the presentation, and I will share with you my time. And after that, after counting the five seconds, our Daniela can start. Okay. We all know that it is possible to classify the days according to their fire risk, the potential to have a wildfire and a large wildfire. Will it be possible to predict and classify the days to have a large wildfire? What I'm trying to do is to answer that question, finding the specific conditions that are usually associated to large wildfires and how these conditions can be used to predict them. They are a growing trend until 2003, the Portuguese fire history practically didn't have records of wildfires with a burned area higher than 10,000 hectares. However, after 2003, there are many occurrences above this area with dramatic consequences for human life, for the biodiversity, and also for the economy. It is clear in the scientific community that due to climate change, large wildfire will become more frequent. But we really have to face this problem. The firefighters, the civil protection agents, and the population that lives in the areas close to forest and can be exposed to large wildfire. So how can we predict them? In my research, by improving the current fire risk systems, including new parameters that have a decisive role on fires regarding the fire risk systems. They are methods that compute several parameters, like the temperature, the relative humidity, and others, and translate the output a numerical value in a daily risk level that usually can change between one to five, where five is the maximum and the most dangerous one. However, the current systems used in Portugal have not been sufficient to classify the days with extreme weather conditions. Extreme weather conditions can be a meteorological event, like a thunderstorm that are happening at the same time that a wildfire, or can be a drought period reflected in the moisture content of the vegetation. So, large wildfire knowledge asks for a deeper understanding of many experts related to fire behavior and extreme weather conditions. A combined study of them is the main challenge of my thesis, I intend to develop a methodology using the climatic and the meteorological factors to predict the days with potential to have a large wildfire. For you or policymakers, be aware and prepare for the possibility of a small wildfire becomes a large wildfire. I really hope that this thesis contribute to avoid at least one tragic wildfire episode. Thank you. Thank you so much. Here I am. Thank you so much, Daniela, 
to Thank share you. with us your thesis. So let's move on. And we since we have 20 finalists, we cannot stop. And the next one to present will be the next one to present will be Angela Besson. Angela Besson uh, will share with us uh, her thesis entitled How to Stop Time, Shedding Light on Spontaneous Mummification While Developing a Method to Postmortem Interval Estimation on Mummified Bodies. She's coming from the PhD in Anthropology and from the Faculty of Science and Technology. So she uh, shared with us uh, her slide, how to stop time, and then I will stop. And I will start to count the time and we have five seconds and then you can uh, start. What is the first picture that pops up into your mind when you think about mummies? Ancient Egypt, pharaohs wrapped in lines and bandages. Those are pretty awesome mummies, but those are not the mummies I study. You see, when someone dies, it is expected that a body to decompose. And the rate of decomposition is influenced by numerous factors, both intrinsic and extrinsic to the body. But human decomposition may not always follow the sequential process in which remains skeletonize completely. If the decay of a cadaver stops, soft tissues such as skin, muscles, and internal organs may preserve through natural mummification. In Portugal, cemeteries are struggling against the massive number of mummified bodies, and city halls are facing sanitary problems as well as the lack of burial space for the Portuguese population. Worldwide, forensic examinations on mummified bodies found in closed and open environments entail legal implications related with estimating for how long that mummified individual has been dead, and this estimation fails as a result of an imprecise method hindering the closure of police investigations. But why is this happening? Why are some bodies mummifying while others are decomposing under the same conditions? To answer this question, I am correlating the internal and external factors accountable for human mummification. So hair, soil, and soft tissues of mummified bodies from Portuguese cemeteries are being analyzed through toxicology and chemical techniques. So microbial community and xenobiotics are just some of the parameters being examined. Simultaneously, fatty acid analysis is considered for time since death estimation purposes because fatty acid degradation has shown to be useful on decomposed bodies, this research is also attempting to develop a new and more precise method for time since death estimation. This project is the first of its kind ever conducted around the world, being a major contributor to the field of forensic anthropology, to cemeteries management, and to the legal system worldwide, contributing to the resolution of criminal investigations. And this is only possible because inside every mummy, there's a story waiting to be told. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela, for your presentation. And then, then let's move to the third uh, presenter of today. That will be Marina Rodrigues. Marina Rodrigues will share with us her uh, thesis entitled Stargazing as a Regulator of Neuronal Excitability. She's coming from the doctoral program in Experimental Biology and Biomedicine from uh, uh, Institute of uh, Re <laughs> Interdisciplinary Research. So let's share with you uh, her slide and then I will uh, start to count the time and after five seconds, Marina, you will be able to start. What do you know about epilepsy? Imagine that you and me are both in the same room, that we have a door and a window that are both open. We also have a table nearby. Imagine that the wind is blowing outside strongly. Out of the sudden, the door just closes with a huge noise. That makes me shaky. I get a bit nervous, which is a normal response. 
but you just start screaming and you end up hiding under the table. Well, this is a bit of an overreaction, but don't be ashamed. This is more or less what happens inside of an epileptic brain. A normal daily stimulus can be perceived as normal, inducing a normal response by healthy neurons. But for a known reason, some cells are hyperexcitable, so they will perceive the same stimulus as if it was a greater one, therefore inducing a greater response, leading to an overactivation of certain brain areas, an overreaction of the brain cells. If we think about this, you can easily identify other diseases that are characterized by an overreaction to normal daily stimuli. Let's take as an example, artists that have experienced uh, feelings with overreaction that were then translated in an altered view of reality that is now depicted in their masterpieces. So Gilles Trelin is a painter who suffers from autism. And for instance, Edouard Mook suffered from major depression and Van Gogh was known to be schizophrenic. The clinic tells us that besides being very hard to treat these diseases, they also have high comorbidity with epilepsy. And in fact, we could find, we could find many links between uh, the underlying causes of these different disorders. My PhD focused precisely on one link that underlies the comorbidity of epilepsy with two different diseases. I am studying one protein called stargazin. Stargazin was found mutated in two different patients one with intellectual disability and the other with schizophrenia. So it is possible to have a single protein that is implicated in two different diseases, both of them with social and cognitive impairment and higher susceptibility to seizure. Since neurodevelopmental disorders share, uh, share the same causing mechanisms, we believe that mapping the links between neurodevelopmental diseases will help us on better elucidate what are um, the, the causes that lead these diseases to be so different in terms of manifestation and yet so similar that they can be grouped together and share comorbidity with epilepsy. As a major outcome of my PhD, we aim at better understanding um, the links between neurodevelopmental disorders that will for sure facilitate the design of new and better treatment for these patients. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, to share with us your thesis in less than three minutes. So let's move now for our fourth presenter of today, that will be Anna Catarina Lo. Sorry, I was sharing, right? Now I got here. So that will be Anna Catarina Lo, and she will share uh, with us her thesis about immunological uh, effects of photodynamic therapy. She's coming from MedChem Train, that is part of the PhD in chemistry from the University of Coimbra, and she's, she's from the Faculty of Science and Technology. She uh, shared with us uh, this um, slide, and now she will be able to start in five seconds. So good afternoon, everyone. Have you ever considered the amount of materials that we have to combine to build a house? Why can't I just build my house just with bricks? So no cement, no electricity, no roof tiles. I just want bricks over bricks. Do you think it will be stable and comfortable? Would you consider to live there? Well, maybe not, because we know that for having a solid construction, we need much more than just bricks. And the same thing applies to the way that our body works. And the exactly same thing should be applied to the way that we design treatments. So today, I'm going to talk to you about a treatment for cancer that is called photodynamic therapy. So this treatment combines three of the most simple things, light, oxygen, and the molecule. And the, these three components, when given apart, are completely worthless. But when combined together, the molecule that is inside of the, the tumor can be activated by a specific light and in the presence of oxygen, it will destroy the nearby cells. So with this treatment, we could have a great efficacy on eradicating localized tumors. But when our intention was to treat disseminated disease as metastasis, we couldn't. And we start, we start to wonder why. Well, maybe because yes, I have the bricks for the construction that I'm ready, but my plan is to build a palace. So even though photodynamic therapy 
as, as been reported to have a strong stimulation of the immune system, it seems to be not enough to detect and eliminate metastasis. And the, the role of, of my PhD was to study and find something more that we could combine to strengthen our treatment and improve its efficacy. So for that, we have explored all of the immune responses that were triggered after the treatment. We saw the, the rise of some population, the decrease of others, and we identified the specific cell population that is essential for the treatment efficacy. And regarding all of the, the strategies, the therapeutic strategies that are already available and used on the clinics, there is one sort of immunotherapy that uh, consists on the stimulation of this exact uh, cell population that is uh, apprised on our treatment. So what we proposed is to combine strategies that could complement each other, just like photodynamic therapy and immunotherapy. And this way we could increase the efficacy of the treatment. So if you still remind about my plan, well, probably I won't get my palace yet, but uh, still, but in the meanwhile, I will start by adding a nice roof to my building. So thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. So uh, now let's continue for the next speaker and let's see who will be the next speaker will be Alexandra Fonseca. Alexandra Fonseca will share with us her thesis about development and validation of the new generation of Cooper-based radiopharmaceuticals for prostate cancer uh, theranostics. She's coming from the doctoral program of drugs, research and development from the Faculty of Pharmacy. So let's share uh, the slides that um, Alexandra prepared to us about radioactivity. And now let's move uh, to Alexandra and she will have five minutes to start and then she have the three minutes to present. People say we should think outside the box but I will show you there's a little bit of radioactivity inside the box. Actually, when I asked my family and friends the first word that comes to mind when thinking about radioactivity, they said things like explosions, nuclear disaster, danger, Chernobyl, and even the Cambridge Dictionary describes radioactivity as very harmful to our health. I'm kind of worried. This does not look good for me. But what if I told you that those two boxes in my slide are used to produce medically essential radioactive elements? The smaller one, for example, was used to diagnose more than 2,000 prostate cancer patients in Portugal last year alone. That box has the ability of producing gallium-68, which given its radioactive properties, allows doctors to see tumor cells which were undetectable in any other way. And when it comes to cancer, we cannot treat what we cannot see. So what is the problem you're asking? The problem is that a gallium generator not only produces small amounts of radioactivity, but it can also cost 72,000 euros and has to be replaced every year. To add to all these complications, radioactivity has a property called half-life, which makes half of the gallium to disappear every 68 minutes. Now imagine that we are here producing gallium 68 and the patient who needs it is one or two or even three hours away from our center of production. Every 68 minutes, half of it just disappears. In my PhD thesis, we are producing and purifying a new radioisotope, copper 61, which just like gallium can be used to diagnose cancer with the advantage of having better imaging properties. Copper 61 is produced from a biomedical cyclotron. And for the first time with this project, we are making copper 61 radio pharmaceuticals available from a biomedical cyclotron wherever the patient is because copper 61 has three times the half-life of gallium 68 which means we could take the same amount of radioactivity for longer distances and still perform the medical exam. 
So with this project, we are for the first time making copper radio pharmaceuticals available from a biomedical cyclotron. And this is why I would suggest an adjustment to the Cambridge Dictionary, because even though radioactivity can be harmful to our health, it is also saving our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for your amazing presentation. So let's continue to the next one. And now we will move subject to Daniela Filipa Valerio that will share with us her, present, her, uh, her thesis about how objects are organized in the brain. She's coming from the PhD in psychology and from the psychology and educational sciences. So let's share with you her uh, slide. And now we can give the floor to Daniela and ask her to make her presentation in three minutes. We are 1.3 million of species in the world. But just humans are able to manipulate tons of objects. We use objects all the time and during every day of our lives. Your computer, your cell phone, your notebook, your pen, your headphones, your coffee mug, your spoon, your bottle of water. You probably used all of these objects in the last half hour. But this capacity to manipulate and store a lot of information about objects is unique in humans. If you think in an ordinary object, like a glass, you will find now that you know many things about glasses. For instance, you know well, the object name, you know where you might find the glass, you know how a glass looks like, even though there are different types of glasses with different colors, textures, shapes, and materials. You know how to manipulate the glass, what, what the glass is used for, and you also know a bunch of extra information that we acquire during, during our lives. But why is it so important to study this? Because this ability to manipulate objects was essential for the evolution of the human species, as dexterity was an important precursor of, of um, the, the human abilities. And we know that you and I have a neural circuit that is more active every time that you see an object. And this is what they have been studying. My goal is to understand how objects are organized in the brain, and we know that uh, objects are organized based on their similarity. That means that objects that are more similar will be mapped close in our brain, and objects that are more dissimilar will be mapped far from each other. But how am I studying this? I started with behavioral experiments where I asked my completely naive participants to press the button when an object changed, while I was measuring their reaction times and accuracy. And I also asked my participants to lay down in a magnetic resonance scanner in order to see how their brains uh, responded to object change. So why do I bother to study this? Well, first, if this ability is unique in humans, we need to understand where this came from. Then, if, if we know how objects are organized in the brain, we can boost our understanding of motor diseases and future treatments. And at last, if we know how the brain works, we can replicate this information in, in artificial intelligence scenarios, and we can attempt to copy the greatest machine ever, our brain. Thank you so much, Daniela, for your presentation. So let's continue, and we have a long way to go until the end of our 20 finalists. So, the next one will be Sara Leitão. She will share her thesis about the behaviors and characteristics of professionals associated with the change processes in parenting intervention for behavioral problems. The example of a basic incredible years program for parents. She's coming from the PhD, the interdisciplinary or inter-university program uh, in uh, psychology from the Faculty of Psychology and uh, Educational Sciences. And I will stop the sharing and I will invite Sara to start her presentation in five seconds.
Hi, everyone. I have a question for you. Do you think that psychological interventions are like pills? I mean, when you have a discomfort, you take a pill and it works, no matter the person who administered it to you, right? What about psychological interventions? Do you think they can work independently of the person who delivered them to you? I'm a clinical psychologist. And in my field, there's an urge to demonstrate that specific interventions work for specific problems. For example, parent interventions have been widely researched and have demonstrated to be the most effective intervention for reducing children behavior problems. However, the role of the professional implementing this kind of parent interventions is under-researched and has been relatively ignored so far. Well, but there are three things we know about parents of children with behavior problems. First, they live stressful lives. Second, they usually have negative relationships with care service. And finally, they are difficult to engage in interventions. So having a professional that is not only trained in the intervention program, but also in the specific skills to reach and engage with these parents is essential to make the intervention work. So my research study aims to fill this research gap and understand which are the specific characteristics and actions of the professionals that promote the effectiveness of parent interventions for children behavior problems. To achieve this goal, I will conduct a systematic review of the literature. I will interview parents of children with behavior problems who have received this kind of interventions. And I will also interview the professionals delivering these interventions. Our research will answer the fundamental question about what professionals need to be or to do in order to connect more effectively with parents of children with behavior problems and help them to change. I believe these findings will not only help professionals, will not only help families, but will work for the sake of all of us as a society. Because helping others is not simply a question of what you do, but rather of how you do it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sara, for your presentation. Let's stop the time. And let's move to the next presenter. Now we will continue our session, changing again a subject that is the best of this competition because we are going through so many different areas of research in our university. So now let's continue with Christiana Bento and she will share with us her thesis about innovative methods to, pre to prepare sterilized biopolymer based aerogels via an integrated process. She's coming from the PhD in, in, of uh, in chemistry, chemistry engineering from the Faculty of Science and Technology. This is uh, the slide that uh, she shared uh, with us about uh, her thesis. And now I will uh, allow um, Christiana to continue and to uh, share with us her thesis in three minutes. Five seconds to start. Hi, did you know that the elderly face higher risk of mortality due to bone fractures and inflammatory problems? To solve this problem, there's a constant search for new tissue engineering solutions. And despite natural polymers having ideal properties for this application, their use is conditioned by the available sterilization procedures that cause degradation and loss of physical chemical properties. So new sterilization procedures are needed for sensitive biomedical products. That is why during my PhD, I will be developing a green methodology to prepare sterilized biopolymer-based aerogels for tissue engineering. The aim of my work is to integrate for the first time three sequential processing steps, supercritical drying to form an aerogel, supercritical sterilization to ensure the sterility of the product and the impregnation of an active pharmaceutical ingredient that will enhance the properties of the material. By integrating these steps, it will not only allow me to save time, but also increase efficiency. 
By using supercritical drying, we are able to obtain ultralight and porous aerogels with ideal properties for tissue engineering. And by using this method, we avoid the collapse of the porous structure that usually occurs with other drying methods. But this process includes one additional step, that is the alcogel formation, to which I will be using high pressure solvent exchange, a process that was never used, but that will allow me to save time. But not only the physical chemical properties are important, and for a product to be applied on living tissues, the sterility must be ensured. And since the conventional sterilization procedures compromise the properties of the materials, I propose the use of supercritical CO2 as a sterilization method. This method was already industrially applied to sterilize food products, and many polymers were successfully sterilized with this method while maintaining their intrinsic properties. And lastly, the impregnation of an active pharmaceutical ingredient will help with the healing properties, prevent infections and inflammation, and promote tissue regeneration. So by using supercritical CO2, I will not only be able to produce aerogels with ideal properties for tissue engineering, but also successfully sterilize them and improve their properties, providing this way a solution for the bone fractures and inflammatory problems affecting the elderly. And this is how chemical engineering can help to improve population's health and provide solutions for healthcare problems, helping to save lives. Thank you. Thank you, Christiana, for your presentation. So let's continue to the next presenter that will be now uh, Pega Moama Madpur, <laughs> a challenge also for me to, to share your name with the audience. So Pega will share with us her thesis about fusion of satellite and drone data for forest vegetation mapping, mapping and management uh, wildfire management. She's coming from the PhD in medical engineering from the Faculty of Science and Technology. Mechanical. This, sorry. <laughs> No, it's the Faculty of Science and Technology from PhD in Mechanical Engineering. So uh, this is the, um, the slide that Pega shared with us. And now we will uh, share the floor with Pega and she will start her presentation in five seconds. Hi, I'm Pega Moama Madpur. Do you remember the intense wildfire in Portugal? and how many people died? I'm here to present a solution for such a hazard. Our forests are under the threat of relentless enemy, wildfire. Wildfires occur not only because of human activities, but also as a natural consequence of global warming and lack of forest management. In the past decades, we are experiencing severe wildfire, even in the countries that really experienced fire before, like Germany or Northern Europe, but our hands are not tied. We have a technology and a strategy to manage the fire risk. The main one is forest fuel management and my PhD exactly addressed this. What is forest fuel management? Forest biomass, such as vegetation, trees and plants are the main fuel for wildfire. So if we can manage vegetation and biomass accumulation in strategic places, we have a chance to mitigate the fire risk. For example, by removing tall trees, which are too close to the roads or power cables, we will be able to reduce the possibility of fire ignition and spread. Unfortunately, 120 people died in Portugal wildfire 2017. Do you know how? mostly stuck in the roads when the tree collapse and close their paths. If there is any continuous plan forest management, the number of our loss would not be that high or maybe no one dies. It's time to take action. My project will focus on vegetation mapping and management by using satellite and drone, but how? I'm sure that everyone used Google map at least once. Those maps are built from satellite and aerial photography and use advanced algorithm to identify roads and buildings. I will also use fusion of satellite and drone to create a 3D map specifically for forest vegetation. 
Then by applying some fire behavior models, we will be able to detect high risk areas. And finally, we can propose a forest fuel management strategies. The result of my PhD will be sustainable, cost-effective, quick, and real-time forest management strategies and reduction of fire risk, which is one of the main disasters nowadays all over the world, from Portugal and Spain to US and Australia. Eventually, we will defeat the coronavirus. But think about the forest, lungs of the earth. Let's vaccinate them as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pega, for your presentation. So let's continue. And now we will have, now we will have the next speaker. Uh, just to tell you that since we are in a bit stress, uh, we would like to share with you that after the 10 first presentations, we'll make a small break just to let not only us, but also the jury to breathe a little bit and then to continue to the next 10, okay? So let's move to the uh, presentation number 10. That will be, okay, now the 10 that will be Jordan Eason. Jordan will share with us his uh, thesis about leveraging interdisciplinary studies, comic books translated as a new intersemiotic test for foreigners. He is coming from the PhD of Materialities of Literature from the Faculty of Arts and Humanities. Now I will stop the presentation and I will let uh, give five seconds before Jordan start his presentation. Good afternoon. Why do people send, spend thousands to send their youth abroad to study foreign languages? This is a question I want you to ponder today throughout my speech. Learning a foreign language is not easy, especially when you're already an adult. Many foreign language learners have the uh, vocabulary equivalent to a child, but their interests are very different and they can use their foreign, their native language as a crutch. And they get frustrated or tired. As a PhD student in the materialities of literature at the University of Coimbra, my project Leveraging inter interdisciplinary studies, translated comic books as a new intersemiotic textbook for foreigners will be an intensification of a Portuguese book that would transform the way people learn languages, learn languages forever. As an enthusiastic traveler that has visited over 40 countries on six, six different continents and a veteran of the war on terror in the Middle East, I've seen firsthand the importance and often, unfortunately, under life and Death consequences, the importance of cultural context alongside learning the language. Cultural context is difficult to encounter in a traditional textbook. However, if we leverage the images that already exist in comic books, we, can, we are able to achieve a more realistic environment for the foreign language learner. I remember when I first traveled to Brazil, some things, uh, some aspects of Portuguese were much easier shown than told. What was that, that thing over there? La, what's the difference? Let's just say visual cues at times are a must. As a former professor at the United States Air Force Academy, I have, I have firsthand experience with the experience and the entrance of adult learners trying to learn Portuguese. And I understand the cultural differences that are necessary to point out. My students were always curious about the literature. They wanted to read the classics, enjoy the classics. Fernando Pessoa, let's go see this. They wanted to read these books, but they couldn't understand them yet. Through adaptations of literature uh, made through comics, we can transform these, cla these classics into comic versions that will amplify the chances of English learners to learn this culture and these stories. My friends in the Portuguese Air Force can tell you just how important a story like Lucia is, is in their culture, and no less by arms than by letters. Beyond making literature more accessible, the intersemiotic text will also allow us to study the adaptation of literature and translation. These images will be combined to make, create an immense, uh, immersive environment for the learner. Perhaps more importantly, as the world is closing its borders and turning its backs, may it remind us through the acquisition of learning a foreign language that we can, we have much more similar similarities than differences. As the infamous South African Nelson Mandela once said, if you talk to a man 
in a language he understands, that goes to his head. If you talk to a man in his language, that goes to his heart. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jordan, for your really on-time presentation. <laughs> the time was really well used. So thank you so much for your presentation. So uh, now uh, I would like to um, invite you for a small break, okay? Let's stop for five minutes just to relax and to uh, breathe a little bit. For the ones that are with us uh, uh, through the YouTube, I will ask you to wait a little bit for us. We will continue in uh, five minutes. Okay, for the ones that are here uh, with us at the Zoom call, uh, don't, don't forget that we are uh, still uh, live to YouTube. So uh, we should not uh, speak a lot between us, otherwise we will share with all, okay? <laughs> Just to highlight, I will put a small music during these uh, five minutes, okay? So let's just put the five minutes to count. Acabaram os nossos minutos de pausa. Vamos então retomar a nossa fantástica competição, a nossa final. Gostaria só de partilhar com todos que por vezes aqui na nossa Oh, sorry. <laughs> Now I realize that I was speaking in Portuguese. Let's return and restart in English. So just to share with us, let's continue our final with our next 10 uh, finalists. Just to share with you a technical issue that may uh, have is in your mind since we are transmitting this directly to YouTube. Sometimes we are changing between gallery mode and presenting mode. Okay, so, but our journey will, will take uh, in count your presentation, not if you are larger or smaller. And you are here uh, in the Zoom, so we are together, the organizing committee, the finalists, and also the jury. We are all at Zoom, and I hope that all the jury are inside the Zoom and looking for you through the Zoom, not through the YouTube. In the YouTube, we have our audience that I think they are enjoying at least uh, through uh, the comments that they are leaving there. And also I know that we are people from Quimber Group also checking our uh, final. So it's a pleasure to have them with us too. So let's continue to the next presenter and to the, our next 10 presenters. So now we will have with us Mateus. And Mateus will uh, share with us his thesis about legal problems concerning arbit arbitration in administrative investment contracts. Compared sorry, to Anna, sorry, to inter sorry to interrupt you, but that's not my 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 title. Oh, sorry. So let's uh, make an improvisation no <laughs> about problem, your no title. Sorry, I don't know what happening, but what happened here. Maybe some misunderstanding between you and other colleagues. So let's change. Can you share with us, please, your title instead of me to giving okay. not the real no information, Matheus? Sorry, I don't know what happened. No problem, no problem. Uh, uh, my, my PhD uh, thesis title is Models for Moving Target Defense Evaluation. Okay, thank you so much, Mateus. So, and then I will start the five uh, seconds before you can start your five minutes presentation, okay? Okay, okay. Just, yes, let's remove it. Now five seconds. Bob is a cybersecurity analyst in a huge IT company. In a day of work, normal day of work, the system starts to show some alerts. Then Bob realizes the system is under attack. He quickly set up the old defenses that he relies on to protect the system. But unfortunately, those defenses were not enough. The system goes now 
the company suffered lots of profit, and now Bob is worried about his job. He returns to home, and his wife is saying, Honey, we need to get rid of these sugar ants. You know, every day I need to move the sugar bowl from here to there to the other place just to distract those things. And we, he realizes, this is a very good idea. I can try to shuffle my system to confuse the attackers or to react to attacks dynamically. He goes from his computer and does some research and find that this new technique is named moving target defense. And it is possible to deploy moving target defense using virtual machine migration. Virtual machine migration consists of moving the virtual machines, which are the resources that Bob is trying to defend in the available infrastructure. So Bob finds the solution, right? Uh, not quite yet, because each VM migration has an associated cost. So if Bob decides to frequent migrations, he may boost the security, but we also increase the costs. Otherwise, if Bob decides to less frequent migrations, he will reduce the costs, but will also decrease the security levels. And this is the exact point of this research. We are developing an analytical modeling framework to help Bob, the other researchers, and the system managers to study, to evaluate, and to compare the impact of VM migration frequency and the system availability, security, and also the associated costs. Hopefully, Bob will be able to keep his job. But for sure, he learned two lessons. First, do not trust your old defenses to protect your system. And second, and more important, always, always listen to your wife. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mateus, for your presentation now with the right subject and the right area. So let's continue now um, our presentations. And now we will have the next presenter will be Bruno Gonzaga, and he will uh, share with us his thesis um, entitled Guide Study to Turing, a successful strategy for school success. He's coming from the PhD in Education Science from the Faculty of Psychology and uh, Education Sciences. So let's share um, the slide that Bruno uh, shared with us. And now we will give five minutes before Bruno will start his presentation. What would you do if a student came to you and said, teacher, I don't know how to study. And suddenly all the students started saying the same thing. So I asked them, how did you study for the last exam? And many students replied that they did not read the books preface, spent a lot of time having fun with their cell phones, and had many organizations difficult. Thus, it was clear that before teaching basic mathematics, it was necessary to teach students to study. So, we asked more experienced students to help less experienced students. And over time, it was possible to notice an increase in academic performance greater concentration, ability to plan, and a more supportive classroom. The United Nations recommends a similar model for safe childbirth. More experienced doctors to help less experienced doctors. More experienced nurses to help less experienced nurses. The result is more caring mothers and babies. At Canberra University, Australia, more experienced Aboriginal students to help less experienced Aboriginal students. 
all of these excellent examples that I spoke of have a name. This method is called peer learning. Whether in Brazil, the United Nations, or Australia, if the results are good, why not practice this method in more places? I believe that peer learning can help the United Nations with its slogan, no one left behind. In our research centered on peer learning, we use theories of psychology, education, statistical data, but it all needs to reach the general community. So our research will be suggested a peer learning model to others, researchers, country, communities, or companies to collaborate with a more solidarity in the world, more prosperity, less social inequality, and consequently, more peaceful world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruno, for your presentation, to share with us what you are doing in your thesis and your uh, project thesis. So let's continue to the next one. And now we will have presenting to us uh, Nuno Meirelles, and he will share with us his thesis about the voice that rewrites farces, comedies, and moralities of Gil Vicente read with the year of photographic mediation, preliminaries for a performative digital archive of the Vicentian Theater. He's coming from the Rotro program, program uh, materialities and from, sorry, the materialities of literature and the faculty of arts and humanities. Nuno, I will give you five seconds to start your presentation. Go ahead. What is theater? A simple definition of theater could be theater is a mirror that reflects the world. But it's a very special mirror. Imagine a talking mirror. Imagine you are in front of a mirror that talks about you and talks back to you, suggesting ways of you being a better you. That's what good theater does to the world. And I'm researching one of the unique mirrors of this kind that was done five centuries ago. And now we have to go back to history to understand the purpose of my research. Five centuries ago, at the end of the 15th century, a man in Portugal called Gil Vicente created three kinds of plays to the royal court of Portugal, one of the most important audiences of all the world. He did farces, moralities, and comedies to help them improve to be better royal court, better people. I'm talking about farces to help them to laugh upon the wrongs of the world. Moralities, the struggle between good and evil to distinguish good from bad. Comedies, the adventures of king, kings and princes and true love to inspire them to understand how to find true love. But our story doesn't end there for his theater keeps on being performed and published and studied. Gil Vicente is nowadays the best-selling author of theater in Portugal. But of course, the world has changed. We now have Zoom meetings, YouTube. That's why I'm researching into a sample of video recordings of modern day productions of these three kinds of theater. And what I have found, it's the most suggesting of all evidence. In farces, we prefer to be empathic with certain characters rather than laugh about them. In moralities, we accept it's complex to distinguish devils from angels. And in comedies, what we value the most 
is to be loved for what we are, not for what we possess. The voices that we hear in theater are suggesting a better world. Thank you. Thank you, Nuno, for sharing your thesis about Gil Vicente with us. So let's continue and moving on to the next presenter. Now we will have with us Sara Lima. Sara Lima uh, will share her, her thesis with us, Women's Reproductive Rights Against Forced Sterilization Crimes, crimes an analysis of the position of the regional human rights protection system. She's coming from the PhD in law from the Faculty of Law. This is the slide that Sara shared uh, with us. And now we will challenge Sara to share with us his, her thesis in only three minutes. So, Let's start, we have five minutes, sorry, five seconds to start to the three minutes. So let's move on. Hi, I would like to ask you a question. First, imagine that you went to a hospital to give birth to your child through a C-section. Sometime later, you decide to have other children, but this Despite trying hard, you're not getting pregnant. How would you feel if you find out that during that C-section, you were sterilized without your consent through a tubal ligation? And that was not an accident. You were a victim of a government program, eugenic policies, or cultural issues. And you can ask me, but why me? Well, first of all, because you're a woman and society is, is still defines you by your ability to procreate. Second, because you're black, poor, gypsy, physically or mentally disabled, for example. So you represent a social problem. Therefore, you're not allowed to multiply. Now you're probably thinking it's completely absurd, right? Yes, but it's a sad reality in all continents. It's really difficult to establish an exact number of cases, but it's estimated that millions of women have been victims of forced digitalization crimes in the recent decades. In the last years, countries such as Canada, Namibia, Brazil, and Portugal had forced digitalization scandals. Several cases have been judged in the three regional human rights systems, the European, Inter-American, and African systems, where unanimously these states were condemned, but with different justifications. And this is at the heart of the problem. The absence of a concrete concept of reproductive rights at the international level impairs their effectiveness at the national level. That's why in my thesis, I demonstrate that uh, the limitation of this concept of reproductive rights is necessary to ensure a uniformity to the court's decisions and the respect to the one of the most important and basic human rights, the right to have children. This research is important to show everyone that however absurd they may seem, serious uh, violations to human rights still happen and anyone can be a victim. But despite uh, uh, despite all of this, I end this speech with a feeling of hope. Hope that one day we'll be all equal in rights, obligations, and opportunities. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sana, for your presentation and to share with us what you are doing during your PhD. So let's move to the next presenter. That's will be Tania Calvão. Tania will share with us uh, her thesis about protocol for the reduction of greenhouse gases in the agri agriculture and livestock sector and mitigation of the sector impact on climate change and atmospheric pollution, aiming at the sustainable use of the other natural resources used by agriculture and livestock. She's coming from the PhD in public law from the Faculty of Law. Now, Tanya, you will have five seconds to start your presentation, so move on. Almost half of the land of the planet is used by the livestock system. While its production provides a major source of food, 
for humans, it also results in a lot of emissions, 400 different harmful gases into the atmosphere, and also a massive amount of animal waste. Scientific research already offers evidence of the disastrous consequences of man's disordered action in our planet. Global anthropogenic emission, and by anthropogenic I mean emissions caused by human, are arising from the livestock and will be the center of my research because it's needed to do something at this stage. I will highlight you just some numbers. 14.5% of all global emissions comes from the livestock sector. Livestock consumes today 23% of global freshwater resources, 33% of global arable land to produce feed for livestock, and 30% of Earth's land surface previously occupied by wildlife is today used by livestock, just to name you a few. My thesis proposes the introduction of an international commitment, a protocol, to reduce greenhouse gases in the animal agricultural sector and thereby reflexively encourage the sustainable use of other natural resources that we will need. I'm pursuing my doctorate degree in public law at Coimbra. And so you may ask, and how does law come into play in this matter? Well, one of the main objectives of international public law is to create rules for all the states looking for the common good, the good for humanity. International environmental law, one of the branches of international public law, seeks among other goals to ensure that no harm is caused to the environment, to human beings, to animal health, in an attempt to keep developed in our planet sustainable. And who has the power to lead such initiatives? Usually international organizations such as the United Nations, that has many arms and some of them just working with environmental protection. So I look for a protocol creating an important environment commitment for all the countries. In a protocol like that, were signed in the past. The Montreal Protocol is a great example that this can be successful. The Montreal Protocol was able to phase out ozone depleting substance to be produced in our planet. My research aims to induce the animal sector to commit to an international protocol supported by FAO and the United Nations and supported to, by the Conference of Parties of the Climate Change Convention. We can do that together. It's time for us to think holistically in what we do, in what we eat. And if we look after the planet, the planet will look and continue to embrace us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tania, for your presentation. And now let's continue to the next presenter. Now we will change again completely a field and we will have Luiz Oliveira. Luiz Oliveira will share with us her, his thesis about understanding dendritic cell diverse, diversity with direct cell reprogramming. Uh, he's coming from the doctoral program, uh, program in experimental biology and biomedical biomedicine from Institute for Interdisciplinary uh, Research. And now let's move and give the floor to Luis. You will have the usual five seconds to start and then the three minutes. So our organism is many times described as a well-organized society, like cells and tissues and organs working together. Well, sometimes. And in that society, who is responsible for keeping the peace? Well, it's true, we've got our immune system with cells that produce antibodies, promote inflammation, that kill some other bad cells. And all of them are like the intervention force that we're going to come at. The thing is that all of those immune cells first need to be told where, where to direct their action, what to respond to. And that is the role of dendritic cells, the commanders of the immune system. As such, dendritic cells are always patrolling our organism, always on guard for any abnormal activity. And when something bad appears, they rapidly take care of it by, well, by basically eating it. If a pathogen appears, they will integrate it, digest it, and run to the lymph nodes, which are the control center of the immune system, where they will activate the other immune cells. 
and they are basically basically reporting back to base and saying this is bad and it's trying to do some bad stuff so go guys take care of it this is of special importance in cancer for example where it is crucial that the genetic cells recognize that something bad is growing in there however somehow cancers have evolved into a way of tricking the immune system into reducing the number of immune cells around the tumors which is one of the big issues in cancer therapies. If only there was a way for us to obtain dendritic cells that we can then inject directly in the tumors. If only it was as easy as getting a skin cell. But that sounds ridiculous, right? A skin cell would never be able to do the work of a powerful immune system sergeant, right? Well, wrong. You see, usually when a, a, a skin cell, a specific skin cell specifies in its job, it keeps that way forever. However, there are some specific proteins that can make a cell change the genes that it expresses, therefore changing its identity. This is called cellular reprogramming. And as such, a skin cell can actually become an immune cell after just a few days. The role of my thesis, the, the project of my thesis, is to discover combinations of proteins that can reprogram skin cells into different types of dendritic cells. That way, we hope to find a way of generating dendritic cells from something as simple as a skin sample from a cancer patient that can then be used to fight its cancer. It's true, it's true that we are often told that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks, but the fact is that for our cells, they can actually learn to be something different. They can actually learn to be a sergeant and keep the peace in our organism. So maybe it's never too late for us to learn some new things. Thank you. Thank you, Luis, for your presentation. Thank you. And <laughs> let's continue to the next one. And that will be the number 17. And we'll be with uh, Payot. Payot will uh, share with us his uh, thesis about covalent cross-linking tetrafunctionalis functionalises M. THPC ketosan hydrogels as delivery platforms. He's coming from the PhD in chemistry from the Faculty of Science and Technology. And he shared with us his um, slide that you can uh, check now. And now, as usual, we will give the floor to Payet. You will have five seconds and then you will be able to start. Can light save lives? Since we were little, we've been told how harmful light can be for us. The blue light for our eyes and concentration, the UV light for our skin. This is all true, but can we use light to treat cancer? This is what we try to do in the Polythea project, the project that aims to train young researchers and future leaders in the field of photodynamic therapy. But what is photodynamic therapy? This is an anti-cancer treatment method which uses combined effect of light, oxygen, and a photosensitizing drug to cause damage to the target tissue. After light irradiation, the drug molecule is being activated and can react with oxygen, which is present in our body, to generate highly reactive and highly toxic reactive oxygen species that they can cause damage to cancer cells. During my PhD, I work with a clinically approved and available in the market drug formulation known as Foscan. But this formulation, and by that I mean how the drug is administered into the body, is not ideal and can lead to several side effects, from which one of the most common is prolonged skin photosensitivity. I believe that nobody would like to be forced to stay at home for over six weeks after the treatment, just to avoid a skin burn caused by the sunlight. And here's where my project steps in. We want to improve the quality of cancer patients' lives, but how? First, we want to modify the drug molecule to make it possible to attach the polymer. This biopolymer is kytosan, which has been clinically proved to have no toxic effect for our body. Finally, this will allow us to form a hydrogel formulation. I would compare hydrogel to a jelly, which is colorful due to the photosensitizing drug it can carry. Hydrogels are also injectable and can allow for a prolonged sustained release of the drug molecule. We aim to treat melanoma cancer, which is one of the most aggressive cancers in the world. The trend is getting worse and worse every next year, resulting in over 300,000 patients only in 2018. 
One of the first signs of melanoma is the appearance of a small changes in our body called moles, but their early detection can fully allow for a patient recovery. Now imagine a cancer treatment method when all you need to do is to spend some time exposed to the light. This is what we want to do. We want to inject the hydrogen formulation locally, allow for the drug release, and after light irradiation, activate the molecule to cause damage to the cancer cells. Again, can light save lives? Yes, and we all know that. But together with the hydrogen formulation, we can also improve the quality of cancer patients' lives. Thank you. Thank you, Payet, for your presentation. And let's continue to the next one. We will, we are getting to the end of our 20 finalists. And now the number 18 will be Mariana Laranjo, and she will share with us the, uh, her thesis about dissecting the role of parvalbumin positive inhibitory neurons in cellular and behavioral phenotypes associated with GRASP2 deletion. And she's, uh, and she's coming from the doctoral program, program in experimental biology and biomedicine from the Institute of Interdisciplinary uh, Research. And now we will continue with Mariana and she will have the five normal seconds to start. And now two more minutes. What is the most relevant question when we speak about our brain? Can we drive without, uh, without traffic signals? To answer this question, we need to understand how the information is processed in our brain. Our brain is like a, a street with traffic signals and velocity limits, allowing the safety of information propagation. But why is important to study this? Because this, this allows us to understand what happens in our brain at each second and why accidents happen. Accidents can be seen as alterations in the normal brain function that can lead to some pathologies. But how these work? In our brain, we have cells, the neurons that communicate between them using coded information that ultimately can lead to two different types of activities. In one hand, we can have the promotion of information propagation, also known as excitation. On the other hand, we can have the prevention of information propagation, also known as inhibition. Excitation can be seen as a pass-through or a green light. Inhibition can be seen as a stop or a red light. But why our brain needs these two types of activity? Because our brain loves to live in balance and is excitation and inhibition that allows the normal function of our brain. But why our brain sometimes lose the balance? Why some pathologies are developed? because we were not born with our brain fully developed and alterations can happen. Alterations like alterations in the number of neurons, alteration in the neural migration, and also alterations in the neural communication. These three factors can lead to some holes in our neural street function, leading to some pathologies. I want to understand how these holes lead to this pathology. To do this, I'm using an animal model that allowed us to do a deletion of a gene in a particular type of inhibitory neurons. What does it mean? So like in our streets, we have cars from different car brands. In our brain, we have neurons from different types. What we are doing, we are taking out a piece of a car, our gene of interest, from a particular type of inhibitory neurons, the neurons that we want to study. With this, we can understand the role of these neurons as street signals. Going back for the first question, can we drive without traffic signals? No. How will be our brain without inhibitory system? A mess. We will live in a room with, with a lot of noise inside. We will be confused. I hope that this presentation I help you understanding the role of, inhibit of the inhibitory neurons as strict signals and also that what moves us is as important as what stops us. Thank you, Mariana, for presenting and share with us your thesis and continue and moving on to the next one. So the next one will be Hall, and Hall will share with us his, his thesis about innovative hybrid structural solution using cold form steel and lightweight concrete. He's coming from the PhD in civil engineering and from the Faculty of Science and Technology. I will interrupt my presentation and I will give the floor to Hall and after the initial five seconds, you can start your presentation.
Hi, if someone asks you what a building is, of course you have an answer for that. But let's take a look at it as a structure engineer with that, I would explain what I'm doing. From a structural point of view, the building is constructed by several connected frames and each frame contains at least two columns, a beam and two connections which are connecting the beam to the columns. These frames are mostly created by concrete or steel, but I'm going to mix these two materials and take advantage of both and propose an innovative system, which is first cheap, second with high resistance and third environmentally friendly. But how? My project is addressing exactly this topic. So stay with me just two minutes. On one side, concrete is a strong material and cheap in compression but very weak behavior in tension. If we create a structure just with concrete, we need big section and large forward that first cost a lot of money and second create a lot of pollutions. On the other side, steel is a strong material in compression and tension. But if we create a structure just with steel, we need thick section, which is so expensive. But what if we combine both? Here we go with an example. We can create steel box with thin plates, maybe 10 times thinner than regular one, and fill it with concrete. With this, steel will help concrete in tension, and concrete will help steel in compression and avoid buckling deformation. Plus, steel box plays as a formwork and remain in structure. So we are saving a lot of money and presenting a sustainable structure. In addition, this kind of structure can be fabricated in factory and assembled in the construction site. So we are saving time. More important than that, these kind of structures have high resistance against fire. And you know, fire is a serious problem now they all around the world. So finally, in the future, if you will be lucky to see a building with our proposed system, please feel safe and secure because my work is based on experimental tests, advanced simulation, and will provide simple formulation for designers. So no death, no injury because of the construction damage. Trust me, I am an engineer. Thank you. Thank you all to share with us your um, skills as engineering. So let's continue and last but not least, we will have uh, with us to presenting uh, her thesis, Brigida Caiado. Brigida Caiado will share uh, with us um, her thesis about emotion detectives, unified protocol for the trans, uh, transdiagnostic treatment of emotional disturbance in, ch in children, study of acceptability, feasible, feasibility and effectiveness of the program in Portugal. She's coming from the PhD in clinical psychology from the Faculty of Psychology and uh, Sci uh, Educational Sciences. This is uh, the, um, the slide that uh, Brigida shared with us. And now we will give the floor to Brigida. She will have six, five seconds to breathe and start and then the three last minutes. Start to imagine this, 100 children on a playground. How many of them do you think have emotional disorders such as anxiety and depression? About 10, and this number is increasing. And how many of these 10 children in need do you think that receive evidence-based treatment in Portugal? Only two of them. The other eight do not receive treatment at all or receive and pay interventions that are not based on evidence, remaining deprived of a happy and healthy childhood and with a greater probability for maintaining these difficulties for lifelong. Indeed, all of adult mental disorders were developed in childhood. Thus, if we treat effectively children's emotional disorders, we will help these children and we will also probably prevent most of adult disorders. But what kind of psychological intervention would be really effective for children's emotional disorders. We should consider three points. First, the majority of these children present simultaneously more than one emotional disorder. And even when treated in future, the same or other emotional disorder can appear again. 
Think about weeds. If you don't get the roots, they will grow back again, right? In the same way, we need interventions that address what emotional disorders have in common, acting at their roots, targeting all the actual problems and preventing future disorders. We call it transdiagnostic treatments. Second, also parents need help. They are often desperate, not knowing how to help their children, and they are key role models for children at these ages. So interventions that work together with parents and children are usually more effective. Third, these families often feel alone, believing they are the only ones having these difficulties. Group interventions, besides being more cost effective, are very powerful because people understand that they are all in the same boat. Emotion Detectives the Unified Protocol for Children, UPC, can be the answer. It is an innovative intervention aimed at the transdiagnostic treatment of emotional disorders, working together with parents and children in group. It is also the first protocol that brings together a set of techniques widely studied in psychology, cognitive behavioral techniques, parental training, mindfulness strategies. When we realize this combination of characteristics in one only protocol, we thought, this is what we need in Portugal. So we are studying UPC efficacy through a pilot study and a randomized control trial, comparing an experimental group with a control group. We are pioneers in Europe studying UPC, and we hope to contribute to the treatment, effective treatment of children's emotional disorders, allowing them to fully live the amazing and crucial years of childhood, and also preventing future adult disorders. Because, as Zig Zegler said, Children are our only hope for the future, but we are their only hope for their present and their future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brigida, for your presentation of your thesis. And now we have done with the 20 presentings of our finalists. So thank you so much, we were great. You were very precise on time. So it was an amazing experience to have you here with us. Since we are in the competition, of course, that you need to uh, find a winner. What we will do to find the winner will be to challenge our jury since they were trying to evaluate you uh, during side-by-side uh, -side your presentations. And that was a huge challenge for them too. Now I will go with them to a separate room. If we were physical, we will have a room side by side at the stage, but since we are online, we will use the, um, the different uh, tools that we have here at Zoom. So we will we go, um, the jury and, and I will go to a separate room and I will leave you uh, for the next 10 minutes uh, with Sara Maral and she will um, join you during uh, this break. Uh, this break will go to the jury. We will have the opportunity to be with Sara a little bit and then a small break to everyone, okay? So Sara, I pass you uh, the session and I will go with the jury to check our amazing finalist to represent the University of Coimbra in Coimbra Group International Competition. Hello everyone again. Let's give uh, two or, more, or three minutes more to the jury to decide. Um, let's see the movie of three minutes to this competition, just to, to give two or three minutes more, okay? I'll put the, the movie. Não sei se era suposto ter som. Não, não estamos a ouvir som. Sorry, guys.
Yeah. Not yet. I think it was the um, Zoom sharing without sound, maybe. Martha, could, could you share the movie, please? Sorry, probably, probably is a problem with my Zoom. Sara, se calhar, unplug os fones, tira os fones, se calhar. Ah, ok. Ok. Okay, I think I'm done. For everyone that's um, online uh, through the YouTube uh, streaming at this point, we are uh, now going, still waiting for the jury to uh, come back from their uh, uh, decision making process. And we are now going to share a video for the call uh, for the uh, applications that you all saw uh, beforehand before applying for this competition for the, the um, this competition. And we, it is in Portuguese, uh, but uh, it is uh, for everyone that has not seen it yet. It has the vice rector um, talking a bit about the objectives of this competition for the University of Coimbra, as well as the, the winner of last year's competition, uh, explaining why he decided to apply and, why, uh, and what he gained through that, um, the process of the three-minute thesis competition at the University of Coimbra. So now, Sara, uh, please, thank you. Sorry for the technical problems and... Esta segunda edição da tese de doutoramento em três minutos, o que é que nós queremos? Queremos mais estudantes de doutoramento a participar das várias áreas, dos vários programas de doutoramento e que nós consigamos ir à final, à final internacional e ganhar. Esse é o nosso objetivo. O estudante, ao participar nesta competição dos três minutos de tese de doutoramento, vai permitir ganhar competências de comunicação, vamos dar a formulação de comunicação de ciência, como comunicar a sua tese de doutoramento, os seus resultados, o impacto da sua tese, quer para, localmente, aqui na Universidade de Lima, na primeira fase, e depois, em seguida, na fase internacional, em que vai ser apresentada essa tese de doutoramento, ou esses resultados, durante os três minutos, para o grupo de universidades que fazem parte do chamado Coimbra Group, que são 41 universidades. Portanto, há aqui um impacto muito interessante para o próprio estudante entrar nesta competição, mas também para o impacto que a Universidade de Coimbra quer ter na Europa. As uh, promised, uh, Tarnostic is agents for HPR to positive breast cancer. Eu decidi participar, uh, primeiro porque foi uma iniciativa que nunca tinha visto e eu acho que estar simplesmente a pensar em ciência como chegamos ao artigo e acabamos, isso não é ciência. A partir daí há um outro mundo completamente novo, que é o de divulgar, chegar às pessoas, às empresas, a quem a tecnologia de facto, no meu caso tecnologia, poderá de facto fazer efeito. Uh, e eu noto que nós não temos ligado muito a isso, e, e isto era logo uma oportunidade de poder explorar esse mundo. E foi com esse intuito de me poder lançar às feras, <risos> digamos assim, que decidi, uh, que decidi ver como é que era, até porque também nós passamos oito horas do nosso trabalho todos os dias com coisas mega complexas, e pensar em ter que falar em um minuto, dois minutos, em três minutos, que é um desafio tão grande que só pode ser giro. Mesmo que não deem nada, só o facto de eu ter que escalar a uma escala de tempo tão curta, eu tenho muito a ganhar com isso, de certeza. Hi, everyone. We are back. Are you here with us still? <laughs> Still waiting for news? Great. So we have already 
the announcement to make. It was just a second to organize Anna, everything. If you don't mind, just a second, because we need to stop the counter. We were waiting okay. for you. Okay, yeah. of course. Now, calling everyone, everyone back. Hello, the timer. Hi, hi, sorry about the late. We took a little bit more than we were expecting, but I hope we will give an amazing presentation also of the winners of today and the winner that will be the representative of the University of Coimbra at the international phase of this competition. So going forward, uh, let's uh, continue. And now I will pass the word to Professor Claudia Cavadas that will announce so, will be the three first places. So it, so all of you, you are winners. So you, you reached this final and it was amazing that you could explain your PhD thesis in three minutes. It was really uh, very, very interesting to, to listen to all the projects, but maybe we have to start from the third place. Anna, can you share? So third place is for Luis Oliveira. Thank you, Luis. Congratulations. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, so now the second place. Second place is for Angela Bessa. Angela, congratulations, we have the second place. Thank and you so much. Now, uh, let's see uh, the end winner, and the winner that will represent the University uh, of Coimbra. Uh, we hope in the, in the end that June in Prague, in fact, now just a, lot, a little bit detail. In fact, the winner from the university will go to an, uh, there is another um, round uh, that's not direct to Prague. Still, they have to be decided between the, the others uh, university. All the other university will have each winner. And so this is a competition now between different universities. So in the end, they will choose three and the three winners will go to, the, uh, to Prague. But we hope that it will be our winner that will reach the, the final. So in fact, the winner for this final here at the University of Coimbra is, is... <laughs> will be... Go, 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 go. Brigida Caiado. Oh, congratulations, Brigida. And thank you for representing us uh, at the final. At the, um, let's see if you can win in the end. So thank you all for being here. And so I'm sorry that we cannot have things to give you now. And uh, at least a hug, it will be very interesting, but you cannot do that. So thank you for the jury that we were here. Very, uh, it was a hard work to evaluate all of you. And thank you all. Uh, that you are here and all the support, the technical support. And thank you, Anna, Sara, Karin, Marta, that, uh, that without you, it was impossible. Everything was very well organized. And thank you all that were attending at YouTube at the University of Coimbra. And let's hope that Brigida will win in the last, the last minute. Okay, let's do it. I'll do my best. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Uh, Thank you so much. Uh, I'll see you around. Let the court. We will share all the different phases with everyone that wants to continue with us in this competition. We will follow Brigitte, and I hope that we can be with her in Prague. But we will let you all know what is happening with the three minute thesis here at the University of Coimbra. And next year, we will have another, I hope. So let's pay attention, and I hope that you will be able also to bring more people to uh, to apply to this competition and uh, make science communication even more important here and around. So thank you so much and have a good day. And I invite you all, the participants, to say a little bit more with us, but for the ones that are seeing you, see you around. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>